Thank you so much, all, all of you, for being here this evening. It is uh, just a pleasure to see so many uh, faces from Oviedo, uh, a lot of people who participated in helping make this evening happen. Uh, want to recognize uh, the city council members who are here and, and our directors. So for executive staff, we've got city manager Brian Cobb. If you could, if you could wave when I, when I say, say state your name. Uh, assistant city manager Patrick Kelly, right in the middle over here. Development services director Teresa Correa. Finance Director, Jerry Boop. Ah, way in the back over here. Fire Chief, Jeff Buchanan. Back in the corner over here. Human Resources Director, Connie Collins. Right in the back here. IT Director, Mike Cushy. Right over here. Police Chief, Dale Coleman. Public Works Director, Bobby Wyatt. And Recreations and Park Director, Drew Bulware. He's somewhere up oh, in the corner over here. Thank you all so much for being here and for helping us put this presentation together and for making our city the wonderful place that it is. Uh, up here on the dais, uh, stage rather, this is more of a stage than a dais, we've got Councilwoman Judith Smith, Councilmember uh, Jeff Chudnow, Councilmember uh, Keith Britton, and Councilmember Bob Pollack. And then I, of course, am uh, the Mayor of Oviedo, Megan Sladek. Now, this season, we are doing things a little bit different than we have in the past. Um, you're not going to be hearing from me nearly as much as you might have heard from the mayor at past states of the city. Each person up here has a unique set of talents and a unique set of interests. So uh, we have divided up tonight's uh, presentation into five different segments uh, based on what people are interested in and uh, what, what they're good at. So uh, without further ado, I could introduce uh, Deputy Mayor Bob Pollack. It should be. Oh, we're, we're going casual a little bit. Before we get all the way started, when you call City Hall, do you know who answers the phone? We're starting at the very beginning here. We've got Joanne and Annie there. So if you call before about 12.30, you're going to hit Joanne. If you call afterwards, Annie will get you where you need to be. So when you call 407-971-5555, these are the wonderful ladies who help you get where you're going. So even I call those numbers, uh, that, that number to, to get to these guys, because I don't always know where it is that I'm trying to go. So if you're in that boat too, call 5555, just like the movies. All right, and now without further ado, we have Deputy Mayor Bob Pollack. All right, thank you, Mayor Sladek. Um, so raise your hand if you've ever said to yourself, Oviedo would be the perfect city if it wasn't for the traffic. <laughs> All right, so I'm here to provide you with an update today on what we're uh, doing to help alleviate some of that traffic and make the roads safer. So. Did you know that 21,000 vehicles enter our community from 419 every single day um, near Snow Hill Road? This is traffic that was created outside of our community but impacts us directly. If you add that 21,000 vehicles to the vehicles from the Oviedo communities east of Lockwood like Sanctuary, Riverside, and Live Oak, you end up with a large traffic jam at Lockwood and 419. So the only way to get to the 417 if you're trying to get there for work in the morning is to either take Lockwood, go down Mitchell Hammock Road, or take um, 419 and go all the way through downtown Oviedo with a two-lane road. So most drivers in the morning will take the Lockwood Mitchell Hammock Road as their, as their choice to get to the 417. And then we also have some uh, traffic going north-south on 434 that for individuals that are trying to get to Research Park. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to go over some of the future plans being done to try to alleviate some of this. Oops. So, okay, so that was the uh, traffic count. So the, uh, these are just a brief overview of just some of the, uh, the roads that were either widening, turn lanes that were widening, um, and also some roundabouts that we may that we uh, will be putting in. So this is the intersection of Mitchell Hammock Road and 434. 
The, uh, the city's previously extended the westbound turn lane to allow more vehicles to queue up during, uh, queue up to make left turns onto 434, but it just wasn't enough. So, the, so now the uh, city is looking to add an additional left-hand turn lane so the vehicles can double stack to allow more vehicles to make it through the intersection under one traffic light. So this, uh, this hopefully will uh, be, this is anticipated to begin in late this year. Just a note though on these, on these uh, improvements like this is that uh, they're, the improvements become ineffective if drivers that are first in, at the light, if they sit there and play on their electronic device and, can't, and don't watch the traffic lights, they delay everything and then the cars can't make it through. So, you know, we urge everyone to keep your eyes on the road, put the electronic devices down until you can park and be safe. Um, distracted driving is a large cause for vehicle crashes resulting in injuries and fatalities. So here we have the intersection of Lockwood Boulevard and Mitchell Hammock Road. Um, if you've ever come from Haggerty High School or live in Carillon or Twin Rivers, you know the northbound Lockwood Boulevard gets backed up during rush hour, rush hour at Mitchell Hammock Road. So what we're looking at is adding an additional left-hand turn lane in order to allow more vehicles to turn left onto Mitchell Hammock Road. The, the construction for this is also anticipated um, late this year. All right, this is the uh, intersection of Mitchell Hammock Road and Alafaya Woods Boulevard. So there's many times during the day that the left-hand turn lane backs up onto, westbound, onto the westbound lanes of Mitchell Hammock Road, creating a situation where only one lane um, is moving. The way to solve this is to extend the turn lane in order to allow more vehicles to queue up to turn left and get off the main road. This project is planned, but we're still waiting to see what the fiscal year 2021 budget looks like to see, what, to see when we'll have the funds available for the design and construction of this project. All right, this is um, a huge project and it's a game changer for those of us that travel to get to the 417 each day. This plan is to widen Broadway Street from 426 to Avenue B. This will create a four lane road all the way from Mitchell Hammock, because there's already four lanes to Pine Street. So this will create a, road, a four lane road all the way from Mitchell Hammock to Avenue B. This will create an alternative route east-west to alleviate some of the traffic on Mitchell Hammock Road. This is phase two of three phases that will eventually widen all the way to uh, Lockwood Boulevard that'll allow those, those two parallel uh, four-lane roads going east-west. This, this construction is anticipated to begin late next year. All right, this is the historic downtown area, and there's a lot of awesome stuff that's gonna be going on um, in this area, and you'll hear about that later, uh, later in the presentation. Um, but one of the changes is to realign Geneva Drive. Um, this will allow for more of a grid structure that you see in many cities. Um, it'll allow vehicles coming from 426 to enter Broadway Street easier and safer, and they, they can do this without having to use Oviedo Boulevard, um, Oviedo Boulevard to 434, or, or 434. Um, this construction is anticipated to start in 2022. And this, this intersection here, this is Lockwood Boulevard and 419. Um, there's many cars um, on Mitchell Hammock Road trying to go east um, onto, they, they come around Lockwood and they're trying to go east on 419 um, and they're backed up a lot of times in the afternoon during rush hour. So Seminole County's planning to add a new dedicated right-hand turn lane that'll allow more cars to queue up to clear this intersection. The construction is still unknown, but the design um, is complete on this project. And the, uh, the last item here is um, the, the 434 plan. So there was plans to widen 434 north, um, north, going northbound from Broadway Street, but the plans uh, kind of fell, fell off the list at the state level. So Seminole County and the state came up with a solution to help traffic flow. The plan is to add three um, two-lane roundabouts along 434. 
this, these roundabouts will, will not only allow traffic to move more efficient, efficiently up and down 434, but also allow for complete access to 434 from um, Mac, Tavendash Drive, Hammock Lane, and Artesia Street. So I hope this information helped and to let you know what's being done to alleviate some of this traffic. And I'm sure there'll be more to come and uh, more improvements. And now I'll hand this over to Councilman Britton to talk more about the infrastructure. Well, I'm sick of Thank you. I hope you don't mind. I'm a little gruffy, but I'm going skiing in about a week, so I need to get my, my beard up so I can uh, not freeze to death out there in Idaho. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our, our infrastructure, and it's, it's uh, the, roads, uh, the road system is part of our infrastructure, but we have a lot of other things that we provide uh, as part of a full-service city. Okay, so we, we uh, provide a, a pretty good drinking water system. We, that system was built in 2004-2005. Uh, it's off of West Mitchell Hammock Road. It uh, was uh, built with about $15.6 million of funding and uh, on, a, on a bond, which is how we, uh, we uh, improve our infrastructure uh, in, in the city. Uh, A.M. Jones Water Plant is over by uh, Boston Hill Park. That's a secondary uh, system we use as a, as a backup to uh, make sure that we uh, can provide continuous service. Um, one thing I want to mention here is that we have a consumptive use permit, which is how much water we can pump out of the ground. We established that quite a few years ago, and it runs through 2028. And then we're going to have to go through the process again of, of applying for how much water we pull out of the aquifer to provide the, the citizens. So that's something we'll be looking for in the future. The uh, wastewater plant, this is out of, uh, in the uh, end of, uh, the tail end of uh, Alafaya Woods, it was built as part of the Alafaya Woods uh, neighborhood. Um, in interestingly, we could have uh, received it for free from the developer back in the 90s. We chose not to. So we, uh, we turned down another offer in the late 90s, and we finally purchased it for about $35 million uh, back in uh, 2010. Uh, the reason we did that is because we could provide better service to the citizens, uh, and we, were, we, we didn't uh, raise our rates one bit. We were able to get a bond uh, referendum to go through, and uh, we made many improvements, and I believe we're about to do a, a major uh, renovation of that facility. Is that correct, Bobby? Reclaimed water. We put a reclaimed water system in back in the 90s uh, that is attached to the Iron Bridge uh, system. Uh, the intention was to distribute it throughout the city, and we've done that in quite a few areas, uh, but the money isn't here right now to put the distribution system in, but that is something that we've got the capability of in the future. Let's see what else we have here. Let's talk about stormwater for a second. You can, you can see the picture here. That's the Twin Rivers Golf Course. We purchased the golf course in, in 2017 uh, with stormwater funds, and this picture is the reason why. That's, uh, uh, the confluence of both the Little and Big Econ rivers. Uh, this picture was taken after Hurricane Irma. And as you can see, the green spots are the greens and, greens and tee boxes at the golf course. The rest is uh, flooded fairways. That's why you didn't have flooded backyards, is because that golf course uh, served as the, the catch basin and, and provided us the stormwater capacity that we need. And I will tell you, it'll happen again. Uh, it always does. So we need to have that, that capability. And uh, we're, we're glad we have it. Now, I want to mention one thing about infrastructure in general. We, we generally pay for these with what we call enterprise funds. That's your water bill, your sewer bill, uh, your stormwater bill. And we do that so that we can get some transparency. Those enterprise funds define what those funds are going to be used for in that particular uh, infrastructure system. And it also frees us up from having to raise our millage rate. You consider it a tax, but it's, a, it's really a user fee. Um, but we were trying to protect ourselves from what we call uh, intrusions on our home rule. Home rule is our ability to rule ourselves, provide the services we want. You might have heard the state legislature is, uh, is attacking that, that concept. Uh, we, we can't, uh, I'll just give you an example, we can't uh, pass an ordinance on uh, usage of firearms in the city. The state has mandated that we leave that up to them. So we've got these enterprise funds. We charge a user fee. The latest one was the, uh, the lighting fee. We were using road funds to pay our light bill. 
now we've got a dedicated enterprise fund to do that. So I just wanted to, to bring that up uh, real quick. How much time have we got? 30 seconds to talk about parks and recs. I'm going to go over a little bit. All right, let's talk a little bit about parks and recs. We, you know we've got a lot of parks in this city. Um, I've got some data here, that, and I believe though uh, we have over 760 acres of parkland in the city. It's by far the most uh, park acreage of any city in the county. Uh, we're, in, we're in one of them. And, oh, here's the, uh, here's the graphic. We're at about, uh, and if I can read that, about 10% of our city acreage is, is parkland. And you can just look at the scale of how much more we have than, than any other city in the, in the county. Uh, senior program, we had a, a committee we developed about a year ago and asked seniors what, what kind of program they, they would like in the city. We developed a, a master plan for that. It's actually gonna turn into a, uh, a program with a facility somewhere down the line. It may be part of our, our multi-use uh, facility, but we're gonna have a senior program. I think I've got a list here from, from uh, Mr. Patrick and, and Mr. Whitaker of some of the new programs we've got. Uh, Jack sent me this the other day. We've got pickleball, we've got uh, water aerobics. Uh, Friday afternoon they have games, they have lunch and learns at the uh, at uh, Riverside Park. They have yoga and Zumba, who knew? Um, we're gonna have, uh, at the COP Center, we'll be utilizing that space shortly uh, for further uh, senior programs. And what I wanna mention with that is uh, what we call the Friends of Oviedo. Friends of Oviedo is a 501c3 program, nonprofit that we've set up to help with capital programs. And I'm working with the staff to develop maybe uh, using that, leveraging that, that concept to help develop our senior programming. You can see the uh, veterans tribute over there. That's, uh, that was primarily developed with the Friends of Oviedo funding. That's pretty much built out. We're gonna try to take that and move it on to the next step, which is, which is helping out our seniors. I'm the Recreation Parks Director, Drew Boulware. Been with the city coming up on 25 years. Uh, seeing a lot of changes in the city, but we're overall recreation parks, dealing with the programming, special events, uh, all recreation programs, aquatics, as well as outdoor uh, baseball, flag football. We have our basketball leagues indoor here at the gymnasium aquatic facility, and multiple uh, programs throughout the year. Um, we have multiple facilities. We have 11 parks in the city, and uh, quite a few sports complexes, different areas for soccer, baseball, football, things like that. And I believe we had some high school kids develop these videos. Are there anyone here that helped do that? Bethany Stand up. Giovanni. Thank you. Good job. Okay, that's... I think the next person up here is uh, Jeff Chud now. I don't know how I got public safety. <laughs> Amazing. I'm going to talk briefly about public safety. I'm going to start off with, uh, with the police department. Uh, we did a quick, uh, as you're looking at our, our crime stats, uh, a difference between 2018 and 2019, our part one crimes, which are the homicides, burglaries, robberies, uh, those type of crimes went down 19%. Uh, part two crimes, which are your theft, your minor crimes, went down 36 percent. And one I really want to touch on because Councilman Britton talked about our traffic, our traffic crashes actually went down 11 percent between 2018 and 2019. I know that a lot of people don't, won't believe that because of the amount of traffic, but a couple of things go into that. First is, I know nobody here has ever gotten stopped for a traffic violation, right? That's right. I knew that. 
But traffic enforcement, traffic enforcement is not about citations. It's about, it's about education. If people drive safer, there's less crashes. Also less texting, less crashes. So even with the amount of traffic coming in, traffic crashes went down 11%. And that's an important factor, especially as our roads get improved, uh, that's going to have to keep up. The other thing I want to touch on with the police department is the department's not just the enforcement arm of the department, but our community outreach. We do bike rodeos with the schools. I don't know if anybody's ever gone to coffee with a cop. Have it at Starbucks, the townhouse. Officers are there pouring coffee, answer any questions, and to meet the public. Cops and Kids Car Show, the third January, uh, uh, the third Saturday in January, of, out at the mall, over 200 cars. It's a great event. If you haven't been out there, you'll have to wait again in next year. But I, I would suggest marking that on your calendar. A national night out is always a great event. I meet the public, shop with the cop. We take some kids uh, shopping over Christmas. Uh, most of the kids. Enjoy that time. We, it, one of the things we, we focus on that is them buying for someone else, not themselves. Uh, unbeknownst to the kids at the time, they also get a bike at the end of it, which is for them. But we really want to enforce that giving to others. And we do hold a summer camp over that uh, uh, we get help funding from, from uh, helpful hands. The other thing in our community policing is working with agencies that help us. Through our forfeiture funds, we help uh, Boys Town. If you're not familiar with Kids House, it's a child advocacy center for the county. All, all our abused kids go there for interviews, for, uh, for medicals, uh, for forensic interviews. It, it's much better for the kids. It, it helps us out. Uh, Safe House is the domestic violence uh, shelter that the county uses. And coming soon uh, is Boys and Girls Club. There's a pilot program going on right now at Antioch Baptist Church, and hopefully the building will be renovated and ready to go at 55 Avenue B by the start of summer. That's the goal. Also, uh, some things about Oviedo, a police department. We're the first uh, department in the county to have a uh, a comfort dog in, in the schools, uh, Bailey. If you haven't met Bailey, uh, it's not quite, it's not the same as the dogs that work patrol. <laughs> Bailey will lick you, not bite you. <laughs> the opioid crisis, we've all heard about that. Not only were we instrumental in stopping some of the flow of the illegal opiates, uh, Due to our actions, we cost a local, a, a local chain pharmacy about $80 million in fines for overprescribing and overfilling. Uh, we also were the first ones in the county to actually make a drug arrest, charge somebody with a homicide for supplying. And I do have to do the fire department too. No laughing over there, Chief. It's calls for service. Uh, our, our response time is always is, is good. The, the, the thing to notice on it is false alarms. Three, uh, I can't see it. Three hundred and fourteen false alarms. False alarms take away from the response time and the, and the service of, of the units. The same goes for false alarm calls for uh, of the police department uh, when it comes to your home. Uh, our response time for fire response is under five minutes, uh, which if you need a fire department, if you need the paramedics, you want them there as quickly as possible. The fire department also does community outreaches. Those are some of the things they do to free blood, pres uh, blood pressure checks, smoke detector program, which are replacing or, or giving out smoke detectors, uh, hands-only hands CPR, which is a a very important uh, to know your CPR. Nicholas Story, Division Chief with the Oviedo Fire Department, here to introduce you to our new Pierce Quantum Engine. 
This new Pierce Quantum engine replaces a 14-year-old piece of apparatus that we have. This new configuration provides for more storage and the crews to operate more efficiently. The pump panel allows us to operate in a safer manner and the additional storage allows us room for our new pieces of equipment such as ballistic gear for active shooter events and extrication equipment for any uh, entrapments that we may have. We carry approximately 2,000 foot of assorted size hose and additional resources as necessary. And for the next segment, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Councilwoman Smith. Before I begin to tell about Oviedo's bright future, I will tell you a little bit, bit about Oviedo's illustrious past. My maternal grandfather, Connell Butner Holmes, placed his application to the Department of Interior March 16, 1914, to homestead 79.99 acres. By April 25th, 1919, he had cleared 10 acres and cultivated them. He had a three-room house, 10 fenced acres, hog-proof fence, barn, pump, eight fruit trees, chicken house at a value of $500, and he attested that he had a wife and four children, one of which was my mother, Gladys Holmes Smith. C.B. Cap Holmes was born into slavery or a year after, I'm not quite sure, uh, after the slaves were emancipated. And he and others like him came to build a future for their family, families after a long night of slavery. I recently was given a copy of a note from February 12, 1917, in my grandfather's handwriting asking the Department of Interior who owned the land at that time, the United States government owned all the land around here, and he was asking them for more time to establish his homestead claim. My grandfather, like many of you, came from another place to this place to find his fortune. We are in the year 2020 in Incorporated Oviedo, an area that was owned by the United States government when my grandfather came to this area. I now present to you Oviedo's bright future. My name is Teresa Correa. I'm the Development Services Director for the City of Oviedo, and I'm just introducing some of the projects we have been approving uh, lately. So this is the food factory. This one is going at Oviedo the Park, one of the projects that is still still going to be um, built in Oviedo the Park. So um, another one, also in Oviedo the Park, another uh, retail business. So it's going to be a mix of uh, retail and restaurants. This is also in Oviedo the Park. This one, Audi is, has also approved a uh, revamped of the facade. So this is the new facade. They are working on that. This is Lawton Orthodontics. is a building that was uh, designed to honor the Lawton House. Over here you have um, the mural at Round Lake Park which has just been painted uh, in 2017 when we had uh, the council approved the Public Arts Board and it's a recommended uh, body, um, City Council is the approving authority and we have already two murals uh, at Central Lake Park. We have the Ovidu uh, postcard mural and then the other one uh, is at Round Lake Park and it has just been finished and it's to honor the black history of Ovidu. And now we are printing postcards from those murals to be sold um, for $1 and, uh, and that is going for the uh, Public Arts Fund. So we wanted to invite residents and everybody that supports Public Arts to buy those postcards and spread the word about our Public Arts program. Oviedo on the Park is nearing completion and here are coming attractions. Ford's Garage, Teriyaki Madness, Kennedy's Barbershop, Ruckus Cycling Studios, Burn Boot Camp, The Food Factory, The Food Factory Bar, Sanford Brewing Company, and in 2021, Breathe. At first, when I saw that, I thought that was a prompt. No, that's the name of a business. <laughs> Peak Body and Life Wellness Village. This slide shows the loca locations of the new businesses within the Center Park Lake area. And I hope you can see them from there where they will be located and everything. The Oviedo Mall is going through a renaissance, as the, your slide says. And it's, we recently um, uh, approved uh, a plan for the renovation of Macy's where, and 
that'll be on the next slide, so let me not get ahead of myself. Uh, the, um, by thinking outside of the box and a non-retail use in bringing people back to the mall, Macy's redevelopment will continue the run renaissance by including multifamily housing, active adult housing, and a hotel. This is it, the downtown master plan update. Another exciting project is the downtown master plan update that will bring commercial, restaurant, and mixed use to the old downtown area. Uh, this slide shows an idea of how this area will utilize that area, and it is an exciting uh, venture that's coming online, and you may notice them doing some uh, work around the retention pond right now. Um, uh, yes, the Oviedo Public Arts has been involved in a number of projects around Oviedo. A local artist by the name of Xavier Moss recently completed this colorful mural located in the Center Lake Park. It depicts Oviedo doing various stages of development, and it's very colorful. This mural was recently completed by Mr. Moss and is located in Round Lake Park. It depicts a few of the black settlers to Oviedo during its development. Um, one of those persons is my mom, and she's the, the, on the right, the, on my right, the second person in on that. And my mom, Gladys Holmes Smith, was the daughter of Connell Butner Holmes, who you heard about, who was an early settler here. And she was educated in the little red schoolhouse that was located on the site of Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. She received her high school diploma from FAMU and Tallahassee and her baccalaureate from Bethune-Cookman College. My mother um, uh, is like most of you, and my mother and my grandfather. My grandfather left everything behind, 15 siblings and his father and stepmother to come to this area now known as Oviedo. My mother gave a speech um, in 1972, and she was sending a message to young people. And in her own handwriting, again, my, I guess my mother wrote because my grandfather liked to write. And in her own handwriting, she wrote about a poem that she liked that was done in 1888 by William Ernest Henley, a English poet who was just racked with all kind of physical ailments. And the poem is entitled Evictus. And this is part of it. Here is a uh, brief portion. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced or cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but not bowed. The poem ends by saying, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I hope that you will join me and do as my grandfather did when he came to this area, when it was nothing, and he worked hard on the land and developed it as best he could. And he came here to see where fate would take him. Fate landed him in this area, now called Oviedo, Florida, a wonderful place to call home. And as a surprise, Dr. Correa has those postcards that she was talking about available. So we're excited about that. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you. And now, Mayor Slatek. All right, we're gonna mix things up a little bit. Everybody look under your chair. Seriously, some of you have some things under your chairs. I, I, I hope you will, uh, you, you sat in the right ones. I tried to guess where in a, in a they're stuck on, there's something stuck on the bottom. Over this way, I think somebody, I, I'm pretty sure that chair is, uh, look, near, look at the chairs near you. <laughs> Or, or, or we'll just do like a, a, a grab a... <laughs> okay, we got one who's got one. <laughs> All right, Mr. Nasser, what does is, what is yours say? Favorite Oviedo event. What is your favorite Oviedo event? Oviedo, uh, the taste of Oviedo. Taste of Oviedo. All right, thank you very much. We have prizes for people who, who are kind enough to participate in this, and they are papayas grown in my yard. So afterwards, come on up and I'll get you a papaya. <laughs>
so for those of you who don't know, uh, Taste of Oviedo is actually a partnership uh, between the city of Oviedo and, uh, and, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And mainly it's the Chamber of Commerce. What the city does is uh, help contribute uh, a, a extra helping forces. Uh, we donate about $5,000 of services uh, and waived fees and donated police officers to make that happen. So partnerships is uh, the, the section that we're, we're heading towards now, and we've got a video to start this off. Hi, it's Congresswoman Murphy. I want to share with you some of the things we've been able to achieve for veterans in Oviedo and Central Florida. After veterans in Seminole County told me they had to drive as much as an hour to get the care they needed, I worked hard to get a community-based facility in the area. As your representative in Washington, I will continue to be a voice for Oviedo veterans, and I will fight to ensure they receive the benefits that they have earned. Thank you for allowing me to provide you with this update. Please do not hesitate to reach out to my office if I can be of any assistance. All right, so if you look about halfway down this slide, there's a phone number. It's 407-204-3363. We could erase the whole rest of the slide and just put that there. This number goes to Kyle, uh, one of the most amazing veterans advocates that works for our Congresswoman's office. If you are a veteran or you know a veteran who, who needs to get assistance, Call that number. He will make sure you have all the rest of this information. But there is, at the county uh, health department, a veteran's uh, little, little section where you can go so you don't have to go all the way to Lake Nona. Here at the county, we look forward to working with the city of Oviedo and many of its needs and collaborating on projects such as the 434 expansions into 417 and moving traffic more efficiently through Oviedo, as well as other projects for infrastructure needs. So just as we partner with our federal level government to make sure that our veterans' needs are met, we also partner with Seminole County and the one cent sales tax to make sure that our transportation needs are met. We heard about that at the very beginning, those three roundabouts that are happening. Uh, that is what, what Chairman Zimbauer is talking about. Uh, the county's coming in. They're going to make that happen in conjunction with the state, and uh, we are very grateful for that because that was one of the most deadly segments of road in the entire county. One of the things that he did not talk about, but that is on the March 24th agenda for Seminole County, is the bear management area. So you see all these little dots over there? That is where people have reported bear activity. Need you guys to do us all a big favor. If you have anything happen with a bear at your home, call it in. If we don't get all these dots on there, uh, it makes it a lot harder for us to, to go in and advocate to try to get funding for things like uh, bear trash cans. But what Oviedo is doing right now uh, is partnering with the county and asking for us to be included in their bear management plan. What that entails is not anybody telling us what to do with our trash. It is setting limits to help humans and bears live in harmony. So some of, the, some of these limits are that if you do not have a bear-proof trash can, and that is not required if this is to be passed by the county, you do not have to have a bear-proof trash can, but you may if you choose to. Uh, you may not put it out on the side of the curb until 6 a.m. on the morning that your trash is picked up. It's a reasonable limit. If you do want to put it out earlier, it needs to be in a bear-proof trash can, or you need to have bear clips. So bear-proof trash cans run around $225 to $250. Bear clips uh, are about $10. So there's a lot of choices to help us live in harmony with the bears, but to get access to some of this funding, we have got to have more people uh, let us know when the bears are around. And not just letting the city know, we need to report it to the Fish and Wildlife Service so they can start plotting this. And we've got a volunteer slide. And the reason this is here is not because we have any specific plans about how to volunteer, but because this is a vibrant, diverse, welcoming, generous community. And the thing that I have noticed the most in the 92 days since I was sworn in as your mayor is that so many people want to help. So many people want to volunteer to make our town a better place. If you have an idea or you are one of those people, please shoot me an email or any one of the people sitting up here 
We are actively looking to figure out a way to enhance what our amazing staff is doing, not to replace anyone's job, take anything away from what city's already, the city is already doing, but to come alongside our wonderful employees who are working their tails off. They are really working their tails off, guys. Uh, but to come alongside them and, and help make things just that much better. Uh, as an example, this last Saturday, a group of people came out and picked up trash at Round Lake Park and along 419. And it was so much that, that we, we couldn't even take it home in our cars. So the Parks and Rec Department was kind enough to come and, and pick that up. So it just helps make our entire community a little bit better. Uh, then I, I get the exciting task of doing the odds and ends. When we all sort of divvied up things, uh, people said, well, what are you going to cover? And I said, well, whatever y'all don't. And now that I've heard everything, which was a first for this evening, uh, to hear exactly what people were saying, uh, because of sunshine laws, we couldn't really get together and practice this. We would have had to create a publicly noticed meeting. Uh, so thank you for all for participating in this social experiment. But one thing we did not talk about was the sustainability task force. Uh, this is something that was uh, adopted, I want to say it was back in 2000. 18, in June of 2018, and we are, are aspiring to be a city that is energy neutral by 2050. That's not that far away, but it's kind of far away. Uh, and to get there, we're going to create a sustainability task force. And Deputy Mayor Pollock has been working with our city manager, Mr. Cobb, to come up with the framework for this organization. And it's going to be a, you know, a formal body, similar to the Public Arts Commission, that's going to help us start taking measured steps towards finally uh, achieving energy independence. Because that is a something, that's something that, uh, in talking with, with all, all people in our community, a lot of people very much want us to be environmentally conscientious. And this evening would not be complete with all the headlines if we did not point out that there are no known cases of coronavirus in Oviedo. Uh, we did ha go to, I, th I think uh, some of the city staff members may have also attended a, a teleconference uh, held in conjunction with Seminole County, uh, the health department, and all of the different partners at the county level who, are, uh, put in, who have already put in, into play a plan to make sure that it's as contained as possible. When I got here, uh, my friends down here on the front row reminded me that fist bumps are, are a much better alternative to handshakes and hugs. So please just be conscientious and do your part to help keep this a healthy town. Uh, and thank you to all my colleagues for participating in this uh, exciting thing. All of you for coming. Thank you again to Bethany and the Oviedo Youth Advisory Council for the amazing videos and see you next year.